Thank you very much, Owen, and welcome to everybody uh, to this important event. And I'm delighted that we have uh, two such renowned speakers. We'll have Dr. Lorna Gold from Anuth and my good friend, Dr. Donald the Butler, will uh, do the response. So um, I'm sure Owen will give more detail on that as uh, we progress. But as some of you will know, uh, the trade union movement has been vocal on the particular topic of climate action for some decades. Indeed, uh, both ourselves in ICTU and in NERI have produced and published a number of policy documents on the subject, and the most recent one of which has been the matching skills needs with skills reserves, uh, protecting workers and communities for a just transition, which was authored by uh, Paul Goldrick Kelly and uh, Kieran Nugent. So um, this is a, uh, our movement has focused, I suppose, really strongly on the issue of the just transition, and for good reason because as our economy evolves to a green economy, uh, jobs and livelihoods will be displaced. I don't think there's any uh, doubt about that. And if this is not managed positively, um, then workers and their communities will suffer. And uh, bottom line is there is no need for that to happen if we have a policy and a strategy developed, well-planned, and ensure that the involvement of the green economy can happen in a smooth way. And successful transitions are characterised by planning, inclusive dialogue, uh, the involvement of all stakeholders and state-led investment. And there are several examples across the world that we can learn from, good and bad, and we should Put an awful lot and we're spending quite a considerable amount of energy and time uh, studying those models because from those models and what happened in other parts of the world will actually advise us as to how best we develop our own model and our first real encounter with, with this is the wind down and indeed elimination of fossil fuel production uh, mainly carried out in the midlands by Bordnemona. And that will be the litmus test for what our model will be like. And um, I'm just, I suppose, conscious last Tuesday, we were in for two and a half hours before an Oireachtas committee, telling that Oireachtas committee how bad our model is and how it will not work if we don't produce and put in place a forum we have suggested it should be chaired by the WRC. That's because of their um, expertise in this area, in particularly in terms of worker-related issues. And we have heard of the appointment of a just transition commissioner. But the first thing that he was told was, you have nothing to do with any workers' issues rights or anything like that. Don't be going near any of that stuff. So, um, I mean, that immediately pulls the rug because the whole objective here is if we are, there are 1,200 permanent full-time and um, 800 part-time seasonal workers in Bordnemona. Over the years, through good trade union-led employment, they have relatively decent work. Uh, some will opt to be voluntary redundant, but you will not solve and produce a just transition by redundancy. And those communities may be devastated not just the workforce, but all of the economic activity that they produce could very well be devastated if this is not in a number of communities around which the Bordnemona uh, company is built. And uh, just identifying a lump sum of money to say into the future we could have people retrofitting and so all of that has to be planned. The institutes of education and universities need to have, we're suggesting for instance at, at loan, Institute should be a center of excellence where uh, workers should be able to go uh, in and develop the skills and do the learning that needs to be done to become uh, eligible and equipped to do another form of work, but decent work. So from that point of view, uh, at the moment, the model is not looking great. We're fighting hard uh, to try and ensure that it does uh, work. But the opposition to this, and all of you in this room will know, when uh, the established class wants to put in opposition, they can do it. 
And, and the objective that I'm seeing here is they want to dismantle Board of Mona, dismantle any trade union organisation in it, uh, disconnect those workers from their original employer, and then produce work which is unorganised, not coordinated, no collective voice, and then you'll see very indecent terms and conditions going with uh, possible work that may be produced into the future. Our role as a movement is to ensure that that doesn't happen. And it's, it's going to be a difficult enough task. So we're adamant that workers and their communities across the energy generation sector should not be expected to sacrifice their livelihoods uh, for the greater good of future generations. And that's the model, the dilemma uh, that faces all. And uh, from, finally, I would just say that there is a moral and social imperative on all of us to ensure that that doesn't happen. And that's why uh, we're, I suppose, exposing the, all of the issues around the Borna Mona uh, company to ensure that everybody has a knowledge. And when you look at what happened in Spain, when you look indeed across the water in Scotland and the level of preparation they have done and are doing and how they have handled uh, the, uh, the, the lessening in, in use of oil and all of that stuff, how they are doing that in their communities is in a much more managed and wholesome way than we seem to be doing uh, in the Midlands. So we don't want the Midlands to become a rust belt. We want the Midlands to be a vibrant community, but not producing fossil fuel. And, and, and the workers have no issue with that, absolutely no issue with that. So, so from our point of view, this is, as I said, a litmus test. And I thank you all for listening to me. And that, from a trade union perspective, while it's, it sounds as if it's a narrow focus, it's one of the main focus points that the trade union movement has to uh, pinpoint because it is key to having a positive approach to the whole involvement of the green economy if we get this bit right. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Patricia. And I think actually your, your comments, I suppose, frame the discussion that, that we're going to have today because, you know, from the trade union movement perspective, we want a Green New Deal, but you can't have a real Green New Deal without a just transition, and we need to move to substance uh, rather than the rhetoric. So thank you, Patricia. Um, on behalf of the Nevin Institute, we're delighted to have Dr. Laura Gold with us here today uh, and that she's agreed to give this uh, seventh annual lecture. Uh, Laura is a well-known academic and climate change activist uh, here in Ireland for, for many years. She's worked in a number of NGOs, including Trocra, uh, on climate justice and in particular the whole issue of intergenerational uh, uh, climate justice. She holds a PhD from Glasgow University. Uh, and has published uh, many journals uh, and, and a number of books. Uh, the latest book, uh, I believe, is Climate Generation, Awakening to Our Children's Future, and it tells a particular personal tale of that journey of her own awakening uh, to the urgency and the need to uh, promote uh, the issue of uh, a Green New Deal and, and to uh, address the issues of climate change. So we're delighted to have uh, Lorna here. Lorna's going to deliver the lecture for about 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll have some time after Dr. Donald Butler uh, responds for a little bit of debate. So if you could show your appreciation to Lorna, I'd very much appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you for the, the kind invitation to come here this morning to, to give this um, lecture. Um, it's a great honor to be here. And um, I have to say that um, when I accepted to do this lecture back in June, it was with um, some trepidation. Um, despite all the things um, you, you just said in terms of academic life and my work heading up the policy team in Trocra for, the past, for, for almost 15 years, I took a sidestep a couple of years ago um, to just um, to, to really uh, ground myself um, a bit more on what is the reality of uh, the, the situation we're facing? How is it being experienced by communities across the country? And um, what's, what's the dynamic that we need to, to, to kind of to harness to, to make the changes that we need to make? And it's, it's a journey over the past three years that led me to feeling quite comfortable um, on the streets outside Leinster House. So my talk today is a mix of my academic reflections, policy, 
and also the view from the street um, in terms of uh, what, how communities, how the social movements are viewing the, the, the question of a Green New Deal. I should also say that the, one of the things, ways I've approached this lecture as well is to say, to look at the young people that we ha have come um, onto the streets this year, especially Greta Thunberg, and to say that, um, why are people listening to the young people? It's not often because they have all the answers, and I can say that I'm not gonna produ produce all the answers in my talk this morning. But the important thing is to be asking the right questions. And that's what I'd like, the spirit that I'd like to enter this lecture this morning. Of course, the idea of a Green New Deal is not a new one. Um, for over a decade, many international and national organizations have come up with this idea, this phrase, Green New Deal. Here in Ireland, FASTA worked on the Green New Deal. There's been more recently the, the, the great report on the just transition by uh, the Impact Trade Union and the IIEA, the work of the Congress of Trade Unions. And it became very popular in the past 18 months through the Sunrise Movement in the United States, a group of young people who had the um, audacity really um, to dream of something different in the context of the, the political uh, situation they're facing in the environmental context in, in the United States. It comes in the back of decades of work of economists, of sustainability, ecological economics, people like Richard Douthwaite, like Herman Daly, um, people who have worked tirelessly to, to look at the intersections of ecology and economics. And of course, the title Green New Deal is not by accident. It's kind of trying to make us remember a time um, in history, in relatively recent history, when we managed to, in the face of a crisis, do something different, do something radically different to the norm. And the precedent that the Green New Deal is obviously recalling is the 1930s and the financial uh, the Great Depression and uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's um, Green, his New Deal, I keep calling it the Green New Deal, but it was a New Deal back then, um, to spark um, the recovery in the United States. There's also, you could think about the Marshall Plan in the post-war era, which was a massive injection of uh, finance to rebuild Europe after the war. But I actually think that the precedent that we need to be thinking of is neither the New Deal of the 1930s or the Marshall Plan. It's actually what happened during the war. Given where, where we are today in terms of the scale of the challenge, the urgency of the challenge at all levels, we actually need to be thinking more in terms of a war on our emissions. It's not about recovery yet. And it's not about uh, coming out of a crisis. We need to address the logic of our economy. And in a sense, look at what our economy is for. And when I was studying the, the whole uh, war, and I know I would say this is the, war is perhaps the worst thing and the worst analogy in one respect, but stay with me. It's about the fact that um, during the war, or the two world wars, we saw the most rapid transformation of economies, albeit to serve a horrific and horrendous purpose. But we saw the economies of Britain, of the Allies, suspend normality and reorientate the whole of society towards a unified objective. Of course, as I say, violent conflict is the last thing in some ways, respects we need to look at. But it does make us think 
that profound economic and social transformation, when required, can lead to the breakdown of society and can also lead to the unifying of human action. And I don't stand with the optimists who are often out on Twitter saying, ah, but humankind has never actually landed itself in catastrophe. Well, I think various versions of human civilization that have gone before us and the remains and the ruins are strewn under the ground might care to disagree. Regardless of what analogy or what precedent you look to, I think what the Green New Deal or a war on emissions calls us to is a time when societies came together to use all available resources for collective action. Of course, to talk of a war of emissions, and that's why we're here today, is often seen as a war on economic development. There's a very strong correlation between our growing economies and human well-being and our ecological footprint. Talking about going to war on our emissions could be also seen as going to war on our freedoms, our freedom to pursue private wealth, consumption, our freedom to dream of a better future. Very few countries have managed to square the circle of upward economic development and declining ecological footprint. Of course, that's a very middle class and comfortable viewpoint to hold. 50% of our emissions are made or caused by the top 10% of the world's economy. The same 10% control the balance of power, policy, corporations, media, and the same 10% are responsible for exporting the idea of private unimaginable luxury as the ultimate goal of our economies. But the flip side to this is that that 10% have not yet experienced the crushing, life-changing impacts of climate change. It is the 90% who only produce 10% of emissions that are experiencing the double injustice of poverty and climate change. Chokra has embarked on a 10-year campaign, over 10 years in fact, on climate justice. And at the start of our campaign, people would ask, have you turned into an environmental agency, Trokra? Thought you were about poverty. And I think it was the experience of working with many partners who depend on rain-fed agriculture that made us recognize that there was something happening in our environment, uh, something related to the shift in the environment, which now we know is caused by the emissions of the industrialized economies. So this double injustice of poverty and ecological destruction is faced by the majority of the world. And recent reports from the IPCC tell us that we are heading in the direction of the virtual collapse of rain-fed agriculture that most of those people depend on due to climate change in a relatively short period of time. And of course now, with the rapid realisation and the dawning that's happening now in Western societies around climate change, the same people are, risking, are at risk of a third injustice of climate change. In fact, they're already facing this injustice. And that's the unjust responses to the climate problem. Given the structure of our emissions, it is likely that 
this, this, the false solutions will in, happen in two ways. One is the replication of the current structures of capitalism and the solutions of individualised consumer um, products, such as we're seeing with the massive expansion of electric cars. We also saw it through the bio fuels which displaced land in the develop displaced agricultural land in the developing world. We're now seeing it in terms of the number or the amount of mining the and the the, the need for cobalt, lithium, um, and how the impact that that's having on human rights. Replicating the structures of injustice at an international level in order to reduce our own emissions and respond to the crisis. But we're also seeing it in the huge displacement of development resources and in Chokra's work as well, where we're the increasing amount of money that's needed to respond to humanitarian emergencies rather than respond uh, or deal with long-term human, um, integral human, human development. The rising hunger. So my contention is that we cannot tackle our emissions. We cannot, we need to go to war on our emissions, but we cannot do that without restructuring and redistributing income and dealing with the structures of injustice. And I don't believe that can be done without, within the logic of neoliberal capitalism. Globally, there are some positive signs that in some countries emissions may have peaked but the global trend is still upwards, and timelines are crucial here. Scientists have told us that we have a very short window, just more than a decade, to half our emissions, and then by 2030 we need to get to net zero emissions. And there's very little sign that that is actually happening, and that the fundamental shifts that we need to bring us in that direction are happening. This is what the global emissions trajectory should look like if we were starting to take seriously the changes that we need to be making at present. Even such is the concern over the inability to globally reduce our emissions and to see that downward trend happen, that that, radical, that hothouse of radicals, the Financial Times, this week called for a questioning of the um, obsession on economic growth in the global economy, that we may need to think about reforming capitalist structures. I thought I'd show you my own version of the, the graph, of the, the, the emissions graph, which went viral on Twitter. I was quite, quite uh, amused about that. Written or drawn, it's got a serious message here from an economics point of view as well that we do not take into account perhaps the impacts, the full impacts, the economic and the social impacts of the trajectories that we're currently on. But also that Whereas we need to head on that black line of a safe enough climate, as I call it, there are many vested interests still at work. And here I would disagree. Um, sorry, I can't remember the name of the lady who gave the EPA lecture the other night um, from, from the UK. Slinko. Um, an optimistic view that we're already over the, let's say, the denial um, I think there's plenty of deniers still out there, maybe closet at this point. So where am I getting to with this? I think that the economic, um, we are facing today two competing logics. I'll go back there just now. Two competing logics that are leading us in different directions. There's a logic of growth, of extraction, of profit, and there's a logic of sufficiency, 
of conservation. But these two logics are like conflicting now increasingly in everyday life. I think it's almost like, I saw a documentary about the, the poor the aeroplane, the Boeing aeroplane and the MCAS system. And if you think of us all on an aeroplane, we're, we're heading and then this, the, the override system kicks in and tries to bring us down. We've got these competing logics at work at the moment where people are trying to get on to a sustainable, to understand what it means to live sustainably, what economics of sustainability, but the override system, to me, is the logic of profit and growth, which is constantly pulling us down. The economic imperative dominates. Despite all, I heard recently uh, a quote where it said, we should act in favour of, uh, of climate change because otherwise our economies will contract by 24%. To me, that logic itself is utter madness. We should act because the plane is going down, not because our economies or because we will marginally lose. It's only when the last tree is gone that we'll realise we can't eat money, as the indigenous saying goes. And that's not to underplay the importance of money, because this is an economics lecture. You can't eat money but it's darn well important if you need to buy food or clothes or housing or anything but the logic of greed as ian gawke calls it is clouding our vision our, our climate politics the politics that we need today as mark carney calls it it's the tragedy on the horizon of course we need solutions that work within markets, and I'm not anti-market. We need eco-efficiency, we need a green economy. It's an important step forward, but it's nowhere near enough, and we're fooling ourselves if we think that's enough. We need a change of logic at the heart of the economy, and for that we need to shift paradigm. And for me, the most compelling vision of this paradigm and it's there within all the economics of sustainability literature but it's captured i think very succinctly in this diagram of the donut economy or the moral economy as some people um, like to call it but i think donut economy suits me better the donut economy is basically a rework of the idea of sustainable development and it's not about future generations, it's about the right now. And it, the important thing about it is that it's concentric circles. And you might think, well, what's the difference between a Venn diagram and concentric circles? There's a world of difference. The concentric circles of the donut economy are based on interdisciplinary work. They're based on the idea that there's an ecological ceiling, a social foundation, and that we need to spend our efforts in living in the safe space, which is like the life belt, as Ian Gough calls it. And we can calculate through the work of earth scientists, through social uh, scientists, and through economists working together, what that safe space looks like at every level, at the international level, right down to local communities. Three things are important when you talk about the ceiling or the donut. Planetary constraints, the fact we have limits, material resource extraction, water, soils, and so on. There's nine limits. The second is needs and wants, that there is such a thing as a social floor. There is a difference between what is needed and what is wanted within the safe space for humanity. <laughs> And the third one is the systemic links between environmental issues and social impacts that requires a different way of working and interdisciplinarity. The implications of this in terms of economic thinking go far beyond an eco-efficiency and a green economy. 
They call us to think about remaking consumption and production to stay within our planetary boundaries, reimagining society beyond individual limitless growth. They call on us to think about a shared space in which there's a more circular economy, where there's a regenerative economy. They call us to think in the long term what Greta Thunberg calls cathedral thinking in terms of long-term planning and strategies to bring us within the donut. And they call us as academics and intellectuals to move outside our silos and cross, confront each other in terms of different forms of knowledge and ways of thinking. Part of the problem of the donut economy for us is that we have become so clouded in our understanding of human behaviour by the growth, let's say, the dominant economic paradigm we live in, that we find it very hard to believe that there would be any incentive, there would be any human who would want to shift and to live within the idea of sufficiency who would ever accept that there are limits, that there's a distinction between our needs and our wants. But the, I think that the donut helps us because it puts us in, in the context of scientifically understood parameters. So we, the physical scientists, the earth scientists, have set the limits and I think that it's important because climate change is perhaps the most compelling of these planetary limits but it's certain it's not the only one that we need to take into account and in tackling climate change we need to take into account all of our parameters planetary limits so coming on to Ireland in the light of this, in the light of this paradigm of the donut and the light of our current situation, is Ireland ready for a Green New Deal? Or as I would like to say, can we declare war on our emissions? And how can we do that whilst moving back within our planetary limits and ensuring that everybody has access to their basic needs? I would say that many people are awake to this challenge in Ireland today. In the three years that I've spent going round communities and talking about climate change and the need to uh, wake up to the challenge, I've seen that many of them are remaking their own communities, not knowing what the, the donut economy is, but basically within that paradigm. They're remaking the logic of consumption I would say that it's very much the officialdom, the policy sphere that needs to wake up and catch up to the immensity and the urgency of this challenge. In terms of our emissions trajectory, if you think of that previous graph, this is where we are heading in the next 11 years. Even with all the additional measures that have been agreed, and we have a great list, it's like a great list now of policy measures to tackle climate change. But it's that gap that despite everything we do, we don't seem to be able to shift the trajectory downwards. Sectorally, we know that there are major changes that need to be made, major shifts that need to be addressed in order to reduce our emissions. In particular, we know the shift that the need to structurally shift the whole area of agriculture to reflect the need to radically reduce our emissions. Transport, and then there are many other areas as well but still, even with what's on the table, we are still not reaching the, the kind of reductions that we need. 
But there are no shortage of starting points in terms of radically reassessing our reductions in emissions. The recommendations of the climate, the Citizens' Assembly set out 10 such areas of emissions reductions. The Youth Assembly held last week set out a formidable list of proposals which would set us in the right direction. The National Dialogue on Climate Change, which has been going on at regional level, is also producing some very interesting results in terms of people's understanding of the crisis and what needs to be done. In terms of what I see needs to be done to bring Ireland into the donut economy, I think that at the top level, and I'm not going to give a shopping list here, but there's some things that at very top level need to be pointed to. I would say that the first thing we could do is adopt that particular model or the concept behind it as a framework for national policy. Other governments have already started to do this. The Norwegian government has recognised the donut economy and has put it as a framework. Why is that important? Because it compels us to think in an interdisciplinary level. We, should set the, we also need to set a zero emissions target into law, a net zero target by 2050, in recognition of our planetary, um, that planetary boundary, and then set ourselves binding five-year targets for reducing our emissions. Once that's done, we need to look at well, there needs to be no new investments in fossil fuels. We need to review state agencies to look at their mandates in light of a dramatic reduction in emissions. We need to change the composition of the Climate Advisory Council so it's more reflective of the academic and intellectual, uh, let's say, diversity that's needed to understand the complexity of the climate issue. We need to rebalance the economic growth imperative with the environmental protections that are essential in order to move towards uh, um, living sustainably within that safe donut. And one of those is to support the initiative or the proposal of the young people last week to, to have to, for Ireland to support a binding treaty on ecocide. I also think we need to look at the whole area of advertising standards. And in particular, the whole idea of luxury. Of course, there are at the foundation of this, there are many eco-social policies that need to be addressed. And one of the things that comes through very strongly in the donut economy is that we need to, that the, the role of the social floor is fundamental in transition. Those countries that have a strong welfare state need to relook at those welfare state or the, the welfare state and all other public services, not only as providing a social floor, but also they perform an eco-social function in the transition to a low carbon, a sustainable future. And as Patricia already said, we need to up our capacity to look at community-based structural transformation, the jobs, the skills, and even compensation for communities that are going to be worst hit by the transition to a low carbon future. We need to look at programmes for massively increasing retrofitting of public housing, the how and the housing stock as a whole, but particular programmes that can have quick gains in terms of reducing emissions and supporting communities 
that are facing energy poverty. In terms of who pays for all of this, I think that there are There are three areas I think need to be looked at. The first is the principle that the polluter pays. And the, one of the young people who was present in the Doyle last week made a fantastic proposal around a reform of corporation tax based on emissions reductions. And I think that needs to be looked at seriously. We can look at VAT, in particular the impact of luxury items and I think here is where we come to think well who defines what luxury is in terms of our society a frequent flyer tax and I think that there could be scope to relook at the whole question of a financial transaction tax as funding this as a public good but even with all this is it still is it enough? Is, are such measures enough to get us where we need to be quick enough? Because the, the, the challenge we face today is that we've left it so late to make any relevant changes. So late. If we'd started this in 1990, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. But if we've left it so late that we need a radical mindset shift to get us where we need to go. I would say no, it's not enough. And I want to end by talking about three things that I think would help us to move in a more concerted direction. Three changes we need to make. The first one I call imagination. And if you think back to the war, the Second World War, and the role of information to bring people to win hearts and minds was so important. And I think that in today's world, where we're dominated by fake news, misinformation, denial, doubt, there's a really important task ahead in capturing the public imagination. And I don't think anything else can happen unless we, this happens and we bring people along on the climate change and the sustainability um, journey. Sweden has just appointed an, uh, a national a, a storyteller-in-chief story to tell the new story around climate change and the need to shift our uh, towards an economics of sustainability. I think Ireland could be brilliant at this. It's not about telling stories, but it's about finding the new narratives. And this has to be something that involves all cultural and public institutions. RTE did a fantastic job last week in, with its Science Week, and it could be used as a, a bit of a model of what needs to happen. But as John Gibbons said in his piece in the Irish Times on Monday, the only remarkable thing about the RT Science Week is that we found it remarkable at all. It's about editorial standards. It's about facing the truth and then being able to articulate that story um, in a consistent basis. And that's a way that's not preaching necessarily to people, but actually tells the story but also needs to be integrated into our public education. And again, the young people last week hit the nail on the head. They hit the nail on the head with this saying a leaving cert subject needs to be brought in all around climate change. And in Maynooth, we are looking at how this can be brought into critical skills at all levels of the university. So you teach the basics of climate change and um, ecological, the planetary limits, all of that as part of a critical skills. But it has to be more than that even, because the urgency of the crisis means that we need to get into workplaces. We need to look at where people are actually learning and listening to, pe to people of in, who, who can, where there's spaces for learning, because there's a generational gap. 
Our generation and the one that went before us didn't get the science. But now the young people are coming up and they have the science. So actually the schools are the last place that needs more. It's outside the schools I would say we need to be focused. And here I would just mention one area that I think is completely neglected. Um, and that's faith communities. My work has brought me up and down the country into churches, um, working with uh, imams, working with the Buddhist community in Ireland to look at how, how they're taking on board this question of sustainability and how it relates to moral questions. There's a huge openness there. There are many green parishes and it's an untapped resource in terms of how this could be brought into the mainstream of, um, of, of our, our communities up and down the country. The second thing, quite word I want to talk about is nature. In all of our, let's say, policies and uh, proposals to tackle climate change, nature and the power of nature in its abundance and regenerative capacity to help us, or we are helping nature to recover. We could look to a massive programme of reforestation. I haven't done the figures, but I'm not talking about citrus, or oh, citrus, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about uh, spruce trees. <laughs> Here I'm looking at Ethiopia that planted 350 million in one day. If we could get the, capture the imagination of our local communities, engage at that level, I could see a huge, sea a huge massive upscale, upscale in our ambition around tree planting. Why would we, wouldn't we involve the schools, connect the education with the nature? and turn our yards of all our schools that are currently car parks into little nurseries? Why wouldn't we have a national tree planting? We already have a national tree planting week. But why wouldn't we, in the interest of the future and of shifting and to a, a new gear, have a national tree planting holiday next year and for the next five years, where everybody you could have it voluntary if necessary and invite employers. Is everybody is planting native trees. Of course, this needs to be matched by measures to protect nature at a legal, legal protections. We need to reinstate the budget of the parks and the wildlife service. And we need to grant greater protection to trees in the face of development. And the final point I want to make is around remaking consumption, because I think that this is actually central to moving forward. The crux of the matter is that, is it possible for us to imagine that people would be happy with less, or at least happy with sufficiency? There are many groups up and down the country that are working to remake consumption. And there's a huge opportunity now to upscale and to support all of these groups. I'm thinking of all the zero waste groups that have emerged in the past few years. The repair cafes, many of whom, whom can't get insurance to do their work. The library of things, collaborative consumption that is already happening, but is often marginalized because the dominant logic of private consumption is so all-consuming and powerful. We need to support this to become mainstream, making it viable for people to start social enterprises and cooperatives to, that are engaged in regenerative economies and circular economies. We need to make this grow so big that it starts to displace the logic of private luxury and ownership. And of course, in that, there's a huge intergenerational dimension 
one of the things I've found going up and down the country as well is that when you start to engage people in a conversation about circular economy, an older person will say, but in my generation, we just did that. We just did that. It was called make, do and mend. <laughs> or you talk about the idea of, of cottage gard community gardens, cottage gardens, GIY. <laughs> they say, yeah, but we all produced our own food. Like, so there's a great intergenerational learning that can happen in the restoration of many tr Irish traditions of taking care of each other in our local communities. Of course, in conclusion, the markets, a market logic of greed, of self-interest, of consumerism, will find solutions to the crisis of sorts. This is an oxygen bar just opened in Delhi, where those who have the means can go and get a gasp of fresh air. If we continue on the path that we're currently headed through private luxury and the inequalities that we face today in emissions, could this be the dystopian future that we'll all face? I think there's a great need for interdisciplinarity in our thinking around this issue, around collaboration and finding forums where different perspectives can work together. Paradigms shift dramatically, history teaches us on this scale. Long after it was proven that the world was round, and then when the, it was proven that we weren't the centre of the universe, people continued to believe it. Often people with, who were vested in that old paradigm. And I think that today we're facing a similar situation where we need to step into a new paradigm where we recognise the interdisciplinarity and the need to work across areas of, um, areas of human knowledge. To come back to my war analogy, if we think that humans don't have it within them to rise to the occasion and to believe that they can fight for a, the future and fight for a different world. It's worth going to visit the fields in Normandy. And I think you'll be struck by the fact that ge a generation fought with their lives in order to bring about what we have today. And that people can rise and give of themselves in order to build a better future. And hope is all around us when we actually look to it. The Fridays for Future movement started by Greta Thunberg. I looked yesterday at the latest map, 2,457 strikes in September. It's like a new pulse that's pulsing through our world. And that generation get it. They occupy that new paradigm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorna. I think everyone will agree that was a, an excellent uh, lecture and a lot of food for thought. I'm particularly struck by the war analogy um, and the whole need for a, a complete paradigm shift, a, a whole need for a, a change in how we, we do everything, ultimately. Um, but whilst it's sobering, I think it was very optimistic uh, and hopeful. And um, certainly we have to uh, believe in the next generation, but uh, there's no room for complacency for our generations, and we need to reboot and refocus our work. Um, I'm now going to call on Dr. Donald Butler, uh, who is going to respond. We're delighted that Donald is here with us today. Uh, Donald has had a, a very, and still has, uh, has had a very rich and varied career. Uh, I think as of yesterday, he, he was the acting director, or maybe still is, I saw something on Twitter about his successor being appointed um, of the Institute of the International European Affairs since January uh, of this year. 
Uh, he's worked very closely with my colleague Patricia King, uh, as Patricia mentioned, through his very important work as chairperson of the, the Low uh, Pay Commission, which is doing really, really good work with a whole range of social partners and trying to make sure that there is a very uh, important floor uh, below which no one will fall. Um, and as I say, he's had a very rich and varied career working with the IB group um, and other parts of the Irish Public Service, uh, including being secretary to the uh, Review and Commission of Taxation in the, in the 80s, and has served uh, on a number of uh, government appointed bodies looking at a range of issues such as tax and welfare, business regulation, health funding, higher education uh, as well. So, Donald, we're delighted you're here. Uh, if you'd take the floor uh, and uh, give us your reflective uh, views on, on what you've heard from Lorna. And if you could show your appreciation of Donald, I'd appreciate it. <clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, Chairman. I'm actually in the first week of my third retirement since last week. <laughs> um, my, my first uh, task, pleasant task, is to thank Dr. Gold for what I thought was a wonderfully stimulating lecture with putting a really challenging agenda in front of us, um, uh, which we have to address. Um, when I got the invitation to respond to this lecture, I wasn't expecting it um, at all, but I was delighted to accept it. And it was a particular pleasure for me because I had the, the great privilege of working with the late Donald Nevin for eight years, uh, five years on the Commission on Taxation in the early 80s, and later I was a member of the, um, the Nevin Commission on the Integration of Tax and Welfare in the 90s, which he chaired very, very successfully. Um, I well recall him at, at meetings of the, of the Commission coping with the pressures of work by working on other papers, but nothing escaped him, and if any point came up that needed his attention, my God, it got it very quickly. Um, he also introduced me to the concept of what he called Nevin's Law, which was that the outcome of any pay talks is the, is the sum of the employer's first offer and the union's first demand divided by two. I don't know if that's... Um, we have a climate emergency. That's, I think that's, that's generally accepted. Even the Climate Action Plan states that tackling the climate emergency is the greatest challenge facing humanity. The prospects for our children will be shaped by our success. This is not just a question of Ireland's global responsibilities. It will also directly shape our own society, its resilience and sustainability and its quality of life. Important point, those who delay the transition needed will face higher costs and fewer opportunities. Now, the evidence suggests that urgent action is needed and that we face a massive challenge. The problem is getting worse. Global carbon emissions were up 3% in 2018, and the limited progress we're making in Europe is being offset by increases in the rest of the world. A significant proportion of Europe's emissions have been exported to China and elsewhere. Indeed, for the UK over a 20-year period, the emissions associated with rising imports almost exactly cancelled the UK emissions reduction. Now, why should we do anything about this? Because some people would argue that Ireland's emissions uh, in a global context are a rounding error. For the world to successfully deal with this challenge will require the large emitters such as China and US to take action. Why should we play our part? Now, some would say that if we don't, we'll have to pay fines to the EU under commitments we've entered into. However, in my mind, there are much more important reasons. The first, and I think the most important, is a moral argument. Our emissions per capita are among the highest in the world, and for us to do nothing about this would be indefensible. On average, each Irish person is responsible for emissions of over 12 tonnes of greenhouse gases annually, 40% more than countries such as the UK or Germany, and more than the EU average as a whole. Indeed, Ireland emits more greenhouse gases than the poorest 400 million people in the world, and that's absolutely indefensible. We owe it to our children and grandchildren to leave them a planet that's habitable. We have to reject the attitude of William Boyle Roach, who asked, what did posterity ever do for us that we should do for posterity? That's <laughs> but secondly, if we so successfully play our part, given the starting point we have in tackling this issue, it will enable us to credibly advocate for others to do the same. I recall in uh, May 1982, I dropped up to Donald Nevin's house with the final draft of the first report of the Commission on Taxation. And what struck me most about it was the wonderful roses in the front garden, which was all he showed me down to Mrs. Nevin, who I'm delighted to see here. Um, she bore all the costs of 
getting those roses to bloom, but our neighbours got some of the benefit because they admired them. This is what economists would call a positive externality. The carbon problem is a classic case of, what, of a negative externality. If I burn turf, I get the benefit of the heat, but I don't bear the full cost of the carbon emitted. And that's the argument for carbon pricing, to increase the costs of the turf I burn to fully reflect the negative costs on the environment. So to tackle the carbon problem, the emissions problem, it is very important that those who engage in activities which emit, lead to emissions should bear the full cost of that activity, and that's the argument for the carbon tax. Um, but there's a cross-border problem, you know, to deal with the problem of us in Europe sending our, our uh, production to other countries. The EU wants to set a, car a carbon border tax on imports to protect EU companies forced to comply with tough greenhouse gas rules. This is difficult, but pricing carbon consumption rather than production can improve the economic efficiency and environmental effectiveness of carbon pricing schemes by ensuring that the costs of CO2 emissions associated with production are fully passed down to the entire value chain. A price on carbon consumption eliminates the risk of cross-border carbon leakage, and Ireland, I think, should support efforts at EU level to bring this about. But what should we do to tackle the problem? Well, I think we need to begin to do some stuff. Um, I think public information campaigns about carbon usage and the steps people can take to reduce emissions are a very important priority. I think while uh, public consciousness of things has gone up, an awful lot of people are not sure what they can do, and I think we can do much more um, in that. We also need to put a realistic price on carbon. The government is committed to increase the price of carbon steadily from 26 euro per tonne to 80 uh, by 2030 in line with the recommendation of the Climate Change Council, though they would have uh, did recommend a price of 35 euro per tonne in 2020. Now there's widespread agreement that the most vulnerable must be protected from increases in living costs and the increase uh, arising from higher carbon taxes and the other just we need to make, which Patricia uh, adverted to uh, very clearly early on, and that's absolutely critical and we need to figure out how to do this. But it's essential that the changes uh, that we need to make are fair and seen to be fair. However, we must face the reality that not everybody can be compensated for everything. We must, we must focus on the most vulnerable, the people facing the biggest, um, uh, the, the biggest challenges. Let me conclude by, by thanking Dr. Gould again for her paper, for getting us all to think seriously about, about this issue, and hopefully spurring us to take the action that we need to do. Thank you. Thanks very much, Donald. Uh, much appreciated, and I, I think um, your, your references to, to Donald and Evan as well uh, and, and the analogies there are, are, are very appropriate and apt given the day that it is. We have a little bit of time uh, for some questions and answers and comments uh, from the floor um, before we break uh, at a quarter to one. What I'd ask people to do, there are roving mics, uh, what I'd ask people to do is to uh, alert uh, yourself to our colleagues with the roving mics. If you just say who you are and, and where you come from, and if you could keep your comment or question brief, because we want to make this as participative uh, and as uh, engaging as possible for questions for, for Lorna and Donald. So I, I see a, a chap down at the back there. If you want to just wait for the mic to come around to you. Thank you. Uh, Kieran Fitzgerald, uh, journalist. Um, Practical issue, um, it's going to cost rather a large amount of money to carry out this transition. Um, how should the financial sector, the resources of the financial sector be best harnessed so that the massive job of infrastructure can begin to be carried out? Uh, what we're talking about here are pension funds, and all the other uh, resources of the financial sector which are currently not being uh, properly deployed. Okay, what, what I might do is I might take two or three mm -hmm. questions if that's okay in, in groups and then Lorna and Donald uh, can respond uh, collectively. We've uh, a question here at, at, the fr at the front there and we'll take one more and then we'll go back to the panel. Hi Lorna, uh, thank you for that always inspiring uh, contribution. Um, I've actually two questions or two comments that I'd like you to respond to. 
um, our wonderful president held, held a seminar in our Sinukdron last week around the question of um, the role of the state in building uh, resilient societies. And you touched on elements of this, but I'd like to know your thoughts on what, what the role of the state is as we aim to mitigate and adapt to, to climate impacts. What, what should that role look like? Mm -hmm. um, and then the second comment is around values. Um, I'm aware that not all climate action is good climate action. You mentioned the example of Sika Spruce plantations, which we know feature heavily, and you also mentioned electric vehicles, both feature heavily in the climate action plan as responses to reducing our emissions. But we do know that there are flaws with both approaches. Um, so how do we, how, how can we ensure that climate action is good climate action, and how can we ensure that our policy makers have the right value set uh, to ensure that, that, that we do this the right way. Mm. So it's around values. How can we get that values? What are those values? How can we inject those value set into the people that make decisions around climate action? Thank you. Thanks very much. Might take one more, and you might just also let us know who you are and, and the organisation you come from. Thanks. Um, thank you um, to the speakers. Um, my name is Una Duggan. I'm with Birdwatch Ireland. Um, I just wanted to mention that on May 9th, the Dáil declared a climate and a biodiversity emergency. And in Ireland, two thirds of our wild bird species are threatened with extinction. And there's a long list of species that are under threat. So some of the actions in the Climate Action Plan actually could make it worse for nature, um, including wide scale um, tree planting. It has to be the right trees in the right place. But where uh, it seems like the biodiversity, the crisis is not getting the same attention as the climate crisis but they're both sides of the same coin where do you see that fit in in the green new deal okay, thanks very much i'm going to turn to lorna first on those three uh, questions thanks very much all fantastic questions um, in terms of the financial sector i think that there's already an awful lot going on let's say, behind the scenes in terms of the financial sector um, internationally, also in Ireland, in terms of, I think, key part of it is around um, carbon disclosure. So looking at all our financial products and what their, um, their, dis their the, the, the intensity of carbon in all of the different products that, that we, we purchase. Um, financial products and that's very very important because it's it's raising the the necessity of um, uh, accounting for carbon in all our all of our, our, our financial decision making and I think that the work of Mark Carney has been absolutely um, central to this um, and other um, other agencies that are working um, mainly based out of the city of London. I mean, I think that, that there's a really key role for green bonds, um, and I know that the, there's been a lot of work done here in Ireland in order to make Ireland, let's say, an international hub for green finance. Um, and that will, I think, so long as it's very clear, like, there needs to be greater um, regulation. I think that's really key at the financial side of regulation of what it means to be a green bond because again we come back to this thing of there are good good and bad um, solutions to the crisis we're facing and th there's various let's say there's 40 shades of green um, out there in terms of financial products and um, I think there's a great need um, to join the dots here with the likes of uh, microfinance institutions um, with um, the, let's say, the credit union movement, looking at the whole question of um, community engagement and commu it's trusted intermediaries, like, so in terms of reaching out to communities, state-backed loans, which can be um, then deployed by trusted intermediaries to, f to, to build uh, solutions at a, at a local level. Then, of course, at, an at a national level, looking at the, the investments that are necessary over um, a five, ten year period. I mean, they're political choices, I think, in terms of um, we can make the capital investments in our um, transport system, in our energy system. It's The decision isn't around which choices we're making. Are we going to invest in more roads for electric cars? Or are we going to invest that money in the 
the, 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 the other sustainable transport mechanisms or whatever. Um, the, 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 there's a huge awakening within the financial sector on this right at this moment. I think the fact the Financial Times has put it on its, did a wrap around on this issue last week says that this is up there now for very pragmatic reasons. Um, the role of the state, um, I think, um, I mean, the state, I think there needs to be a much more proactive role in terms of um, the balance between state-backed programmes to uh, tackle the climate crisis and what is left to, um, like, so the state has become, like, the role in, in regulation and the, is obviously key, but also the role in terms of uh, underwriting and um, like having much more expansive programmes. I mean, you're seeing this happening in the UK, bizarrely, in my eyes, but it's a sign that things are shifting politically right at the moment where there seems to be a pinnacle of neoliberal, roll back the state, regulatory is the only role states play. The, the, the Conservative and the Labour Party are vying to increase public spending in various type ways around, I mean, I think it's always a pendulum, but I think that there is a much more proactive role for the state to play. And I think that whole question of uh, the state backing trusted intermediaries, so local intermediary organisations, the ones that comes to my mind is like the Tipperary Energy Authority, other regional kind of groupings, um, but I think also the state as convener, um, there is no way we're going to make the changes we need in the time that's required without a very um, robust art debate. Um, we had the whole area of social partnership, there was the National Economic Forum, but we need to bring that, we need something that would be like a new contract, a new social e ecological contract. Um, in terms of values, I think that that needs to be worked out in such a forum. But I think for me, I, I pointed to the, I think best for nature has to be top because of the regenerative capacity of nature um, and coming to Una's question as well. And then in terms of community, community led, community driven, uh, looking at where people are getting it right. Um, so building on those who are, and I mean, fundamental has to be behind, unite behind the science. I think that, like the science of climate and but the, that's why I chose the donut, because it's complex and it brings the, the question of ecological collapse. We're not talking here just about climate. We're talking about ecological collapse. And I think that's, I would never see them as vying for attention, well they do vie for attention, but we need to look at it in that complexity um, of the, the nine planetary limits and the, the result of breaching those is ecological breakdown, including uh, climate. Thanks very much, Lauren. I'm gonna ask uh, Donald to uh, give his perspective on, on any of the questions he's heard and it will take some more. Uh, just, just very briefly, the way I think about the role of the state, is we're going to have to uh, change our behavior very significantly. I think the state has an important role in actually giving us the information, yeah. which I mentioned earlier, um, and also ensuring that the incentives we face actually get us to do the right thing. I think that's something the state can do. And the final one that seems to me very important is the state has a vital role in protecting people, the vulnerable. Yeah. Only the state can do that. In other words, people who are yes. most negatively impacted, like the workers in Bordemona, like people suffering from fuel poverty, they can that can only be tackled at a, at a, a state level, and that's a critical um, part of this, it seems to me. Thanks, Donald. I saw a few more hands up. Okay, we've got a colleague here with the glasses, uh, and then this lady at the front, uh, and we'll take uh, this colleague here on the right then, and then we'll have answers and an opportunity for more questions. If you just say who you are and where you come from, that would be great, thanks. Uh, Fergal Costello is my name, uh, and I speak as uh, somebody who's been involved in the trade union movement all my life at various levels during my working life and now latterly uh, heavily involved in Friends with the Earth and Extinction Rebellion. Uh, I think looking at it from a trade union point of view, 
trade unions, trade unionists are caught between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, uh, the kind of transition poses problems in terms of like what we see in Borden and Mona, uh, and these have got to be addressed. <coughs> On the other hand, if the trade union movement opposes uh, the movement to a reduction in emissions, such as things like carbon tax and uh, various other things, closing down Money Point and Borden and Mona, uh, this poses a huge threat to the workers. So what uh, kind of should our strategy be? Uh, so my questions really revolve around two things. One is inequality. Personally, I believe that climate change action and inequality are directly interlinked. In the sense that Lauren spoke about the war that we're engaged in and we've got to declare war. Well, war has already been declared mm. by emissions. And they're being led by mega rich people throughout the world who control the banking, the investment industry, and the fossil fuel industry. They know what they're doing. They're mega rich and they're driven by wanting more and more. Uh, so what I'm really saying then is that I feel to be successful, the trade union movement has got to integrate deeply within the environmental movement. Uh, because only then will you get a program from the environmentalists which incorporate just transition. You won't get just transition from a right of centre government who represent people who are the moneyed class. So this is why uh, I think that this is the, the way we've got to move. It was very heartening for me to see on the last school strikes that we had an abundance of trade union banners, probably more than I've seen in any of the other school strikes throughout Europe. Uh, we had SIP2 well represented, all the teachers unions, Impact, uh, lots of the unions, which was absolutely wonderful. I think we've got to continue in this line. So my two questions are the relationship between inequality and climate change and climate action. And the other one is the need for uh, the trade union movement to integrate into the environmental movement so that we can insist, for example, like board and owner workers who lose their job in a, in a semi-state company get employed by a semi-state company or the same company to carry out retrofit and bog renewal and all that kind of thing. Thank you very much, Fergal. Got a lady here at the front on the right. Take next. Hello, um, my name is Anne Ryan. Uh, I'm involved with FAST, uh, the Foundation for the Economics of Sustainability and Basic Income Ireland, and also with a community supported farm in Selbridge. <laughs> so, uh, thanks both to Donal and, um, and Lorna, and also to the previous questioners, because my, my question sort of follows on in a way. Um, Donal mentioned how, and Do Lorna also said, how um, the rich countries are producing the emissions and other, country, other places are suffering. And of course, that's huge inequality. Um, and Lorna mentioned how also we are in danger of um, trying to capture all of the precious resources that exist to make our electric cars and our wind turbines and so on. So I'd like to, if Lorna, given your experience with Trocra and so on, if you could comment on how Ireland and the state, which has also been a theme, might make common cause with some of those countries. For example, Eritrea or Liberia that have populations around the same size as Ireland. Just given Ireland's history of development aid and of reaching out to other countries, how might we, might we reimagine that for the challenges that, that we see now? Mm. Thank you. We'll take, uh, we'll take one more question uh, at this point. We've got this, this gentleman here, and then we've got more time for more questions. Um, <coughs> James Pike, architect. Um, I think one of the most key issues is spatial strategy. Um, the consolidation of our cities, towns, and villages. And that has started to a certain extent with the new national planning framework, but it doesn't go nearly far enough. Um, Honestly, the studies we are doing show that, in fact, you could contain the doubling the growth of Dublin within its existing circumference 
and it still would not be a very dense city by, a dense city by European standards. Densification is taking place, particularly in the cities in Scandinavia and elsewhere. Um, so it, we've done studies that show that there is more than enough land and the use of underused land, consolidation of existing settlements, and the fact that we do have a very considerable change in our demographics, so that 75% of, house, of households are one, two, or three people. In other words, we don't need the building a, a lot more family houses at all. What we need are um, smaller apartments, uh, probably. So the consolidation is possible, and I think it has to happen, um, right, particularly down our cities, because we're doing a study on Irish cities within a projected population increase for the whole island, up to 10 million, which is definitely going to happen within this century. And we need to plan for that and to really um, take that action. So I think what I'd call urban consolidation, persuading people too in the rural community to want to live in villages, this immediately uh, encourages in fact the whole issue of reducing of, or almost getting rid of the motor car. We need to spend our money now on public transport and on consolidation of the, our existing communities and really getting us back on our bikes and on our, on our feet. <laughs> Thanks very much, James. Uh, I'll go back to the panel. So three fundamental issues, uh, advice and very welcomed for the trade union movement. The whole issue of Ireland making common cause with other, other states and spatial strategy on transport, Lorna. Um, yeah, fantastic questions. Um, Fergal, your question or your state, the, the rock in a hard place, it's, it's absolutely, it's often where it's seen, like, because um, I guess we're, the reality of the climate crisis is, is coming on top of inequality, is coming on top of um, precariousness and the, the, the current um, economic paradigm that, that, that we're working in. Um, and I think there's ample evidence as well that um, growth, inequality, highly unequal societies will find it harder to make transition. Um, emissions inequalities are contributing to our climate emissions significantly. And the, social, the lack of social cohesion, when you have highly unequal societies, asking people to change becomes more difficult. So you're absolutely right. that They, they go absolutely hand in hand. Um, and I talk a bit more about that. I've got a paper that I was speaking to this morning, but I go into much more depth on that in my, in my paper. I mean, it comes back to, to a number of things um, that I touched on in the paper. We, this idea of, of, of need and luxury is, is absolutely key when it comes to looking at the whole question of inequality. And the, there's um, so much work has been done on that, but it's never been taken up really within, let's say, modern Western countries. Um, the work of um, um, Jeffrey Sachs and others. And it's not just about changing our indicators. Indicator change is important. But this whole question of like, there is a point where there's a threshold of satiability, let's say, where people have enough, but we've forgotten there is such a thing as enough, um, or there is such, a, President Higgins talked about it last week, but why are we so obsessed by insatiability and not, we don't give any attention to sufficiency? Sufficiency is a concept that we need to reintroduce to the economics textbooks. The question, the whole idea of steady state, uh, looking then potentially to degrowth, but degrowth is within in unequal societies is much more, it's very, very difficult to, to think about because growth is essential to reach the threshold of satiability. Like, so we can't even think about that until people's basic needs, not until, but like it has to be within the context of ful fulfilling people's basic needs. Um, in terms of, so I think that like the whole, that has to be part of the, the kind of, because you treat luxuries different to needs in terms of taxation, right? And it's, I think, where the possibility of VAT comes in and other kinds of levies, well, not that we want multiple levies on everything, but like the frequent flyer thing would be an essential part or part of that. And I know that aviation 
uh, there's a big discussion in Europe this week on aviation um, and taxation and uh, the carbon tax. Um, who I think, and there's, you were talking about a, a strategy for workers, the need for planning, and I think that's one of the real challenges now is that because of the, the time scales and frames and um, when you, we will see, I think, many countries moving into emergency mode on climate change in the next five, ten years because um, the impacts that, that are being felt right across the world are becoming so severe so quickly that that what happens is you move into that emergency mode, and that's not a great thing. If you read sh the shock doctrine, Naomi Klein's book, around the power of the state in an emergency, it's not... So we need to take this window to look at what would radical transition look like and plan for it. But as I... The whole kind of message of my talk is that we need to put this... And we ask often, what's the economy for? Um, or we don't ask that usually, but we need to start asking that question. What's the economy for? Um, and the, the for has to be now about moving back within planetary boundaries and, in, and moving towards more equality. And if you take those two axes, you start to look at the different menu of policy options. I think there's a need to relook at the whole question, as I mentioned, of in terms of polluter pays, the big corporations, uh, carbon taxes on individuals, I think, are going to be uh, very hard in the absence of other measures to reduce inequality. We need to look much more at the production and the taxing, taxing at production and taxing at profits. Um, there's the whole Stiglitz Commission on International Taxation, which was completely ignored in the context of the Sustainable Development Rules Goals. Um, I'm going on too, too long here, but Anne... Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's so much has to be done in terms of the, the whole question of international development, cooperation, aid, in terms of supporting a green transition in, um, the, the, let's say, the global south. Um, and doing so through collab, not just in terms of the, the aid budget, but looking at the whole, um, whole range of supports that... Um, Ireland and could could give in terms of the transition, in terms of patents, um, in terms of technology transfer, um, in terms of migration is going to be a massive thing in the future, like because it's one of the single biggest impacts um, that, that climate change is going to have. Uh, supporting countries, I mean, the, often the poorer countries are going ahead of us, like the example of Ethiopia, in terms of seeing opportunities, but are still subject to the, the resource grabs that are happening and, and the, 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 the lack of regulation in terms of corporations in the case of the energy sector. But reform needs to happen um, there. Spatial planning absolutely is, is central to, to all of this. I'm a geographer by profession, so um, it's very much in my blood. Um, and bringing, I guess, when you look at the re review of state agencies in light of the climate emergency, you need to look at the role of onboard planola as well, and all the planning regulations. I live in Maynooth, and I was up against onboard planola in recently um, in respect of a massive development in Maynooth, and tried to bring some evidence in relation to climate change and they were, I was looked at like I had two <coughs> heads. Um, so when we think that this is understood within state agencies, and it's, it, it, maybe it has in the past year, but it still seems to be quite distant in terms of um, regulatory frameworks that we're operating to. Because yes, we can increase the density of housing in Dublin, and that increased density of housing is really, really important as a strategy, but we also have to take into account now the the impacts that climate change will have on um, the sea level rise even if we do everything now right so we need to, there needs to be a 10 20 year horizon to that thanks lorna donald the only thing i want to is strongly endorse james pike's uh, emphasis on the importance of spatial strategy 
we've missed a beat here with all the development that took on in the, the mad years. If you put um, the area of Dublin, the superimposed on London, we take up all the area within the M25. We have, what, million, million and a half. They have eight million in that <laughs> same area. And we've been too slow to actually uh, increase the, int the intensity of, of um, you know, we, and we've gone sprawled, or, you know, we've, mm. like Los Angeles or Phoenix, you know, it's, it's been crazy, but we need to stop doing that. Thanks, Noel. I'm gonna take two final questions. I know there's loads of hands up. I'm really sorry about this, but we are running out of time. Uh, and I've been told that I, we need to wrap this up uh, in the next few minutes. So I know I have Claire Bailey, MLA. I mean, we're, we're an all-island organization. I'm delighted that Claire's here. She's a green MLA from, from Belfast. I'm gonna take Claire, and I'm gonna take the, the hand down at the back, uh, Michael, that, that, that I've seen up for some time. Apologies to everybody else. But I do think over lunch, there's an opportunity for people to, there is lunch in the members' room at a quarter to one. There will be an opportunity for people to have an engagement with Lorna and Donald and with each other. I'm delighted to see so many hands up. I think it speaks volumes, but, but I do think we need to stick to the time. So I'll ask Claire and Michael to be brief, and our, our, our panel is to be brief as well, and then we will say a few concluding comments. Claire. Thanks very much. I want to ask a politician to be brief. That's a brief one. <laughs> well, I know you won't let me down, Claire. <laughs> well, I just first want to thank Lorna for the, the talk. That was absolutely fabulous. Uh, and you, you just took a, a complex idea and made it sound very common sense and practical. So that's a skill in itself, and thank you. But I would maybe looking at, so the Green New Deal, and go back to the question of the lecture, is Ireland ready for a Green New Deal? The Green New Deal is not a new concept. We've been discussing this for a long time. We see other states, other governments who are implementing and working forward, yet we're seeing very little to nothing going on uh, in Ireland. We've seen that on the charts, we see that with the evidence. But your three ideas at the end there in terms of imagination, nature and community, uh, I'm putting that into the context of Greta Thunberg, David Attenborough, the school strikes, Extinction Rebellion. Who would you hang your hat on if you had to hang it up in one peg in terms of will it be the state and the decision makers or will it be the community um, that will drive the changes hmm. needed? Super, a, a politician who was very brief <laughs> for play. Hmm. Uh, we'll take Michael at the back. Uh, Laura, for Michael O'Halloran is my name, a, a pensioner and a community activist. Just want to make two very brief points. One, I want to ask you a question. What do we need to do in Ireland to create an infrastructure of organizations who should be planning to help us deal with climate change? The reason I ask you that is that we had Board Panola given a decision that put a thousand people out of work in Board Nimona. Not good enough. That should have been planned well in advance and infrastructure, sorry, uh, inv sorry Adjustments should have been made to help those people adjust to that situation. Didn't happen. The other point I want to make is, and my granddaughter asked me to ask this question. She's an activist like myself. And the question she asked me last night was, if we achieve all the re reductions in emissions that we want to achieve for the wonderful work of academics like yourself, political people, etc., etc. What good will it do if the United States carries out this irresponsible attitude towards the environment? Are we going to make it easy for them to continue to have a high standard of living at the expense of the rest of the world? There are my two questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Michael and Claire. Mm -hmm. So the, is Ireland ready for this, I guess, is the first question, and who will drive the changes? I think that um, this has to, it has to be driven from the grassroots upwards and from, like, so, a, let's say, a coalition of the willing. I think there's a huge opportunity now looking to the next general election in particular and then beyond for a, a coming together of the, the, the environmental and social movements We've seen massive protests on the housing side. We've seen massive protests on the, the climate side. And I think that, 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 that there is a groundswell of um, desire for change, uh, looking at inequality and looking at the climate crisis. I think that there now needs, that needs to be organised into something that's, like, say, 
draws the trade unions, draws the social movements, the environmental movements, a civil society, let's say, coalition uh, for, for a Green New Deal that looks at, I mean, one of the problems I think, or challenges we will face is of language because there are so many different Green New Deals being proposed now and different parties have their Green New Deal. But, and so we're going to have many Green New Deals. That's fantastic on one level. But I think that we need to look at building as wide a consensus as possible on core measures that are cross-party, cross because this is beyond party politics. Um, and, and, but it's going to require even more public engagement. I, I think that if we think we've won the war, let's say, <laughs> on the information side, we're, we're fooling ourselves. Um, and that, it's absolutely essential that that's sustained and built on and that it starts, we start to look at common policy proposals around that. Um, uh, yeah, I think you were echoing some of the comments that were made by Patricia earlier in terms of like, yeah, like it's, it's not good enough to um, make announcements of like a just, just transition commissioner and then make the announcements that were made in relation to board and Mona on the same, practically on the same day. And then no understanding of what's the connection between these and has one to do with the other. And it's like we need to, we, we're challenged to plan. And I think when I was saying about the logic of growth is clouding our, our, um, our ability to plan, I think, and I think we need to look at planning much more seriously and look at the need for collaboration cross interdisciplinary work. Um, if we're going to, because planning is going to be so important as we're facing emergency situations as a result of climate change too. Um, the what good it will do um, if, if the other big polluters um, just continue with business as usual. Um, I think on the one hand, I can't answer that. Um, it comes back to moral, moral imperative. Um, I want to do, I would, we need to do our bit. Um, and that's what we're asked to do, is our part of it. Um, and let's face it, Ireland, and I mean, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but we punch above our weight in terms of the diaspora, in terms of the influence that we have in, on global culture, I think. And that's why I think this question of imagination and of community and nature is so important. We can bring that into the conversation globally and could have a huge, significant impact. Thanks very much, uh, Lorna. And uh, I just want to make a few very brief concluding comments, a few thanks, because we're, we're running out of, out of time. Um, I don't know about you, but I've sometimes come to many lectures and talks like this, and I say this, I make the apologies to all the academics in the room. Sometimes uh, you get a lot on the analysis of the problem, but sometimes a lot less on the solutions. And I think today, from Lorna and from Donald's response as well, we got a lot of detail on practical, on practicals, practical ways and practical approaches to try and address uh, this crisis that, that we, are, we are living through. So I, I found it a, an illuminating and engaging lecture. And thank you, Donald and Lorna, for your time and effort today. And I want to, on behalf of Nevin, make a very uh, brief presentation, just a small token of our uh, respect and uh, our regard for both of you giving your time uh, here today. So, Lorna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I want to acknowledge all the contributions from the floor and I apologise to those who had their hands up uh, but again over lunch hopefully uh, those comments and uh, questions can be, can be debated and discussed but I think the fact that we had so many uh, people wanting to uh, participate speaks volumes about uh, the lecture, uh, the response and the interest in the issue. Uh, I want to again just, I'm, I'm delighted that, that Maura and Anne are here, this is the third time I've been at the Nevin lecture and they've, they've both been here whether it's in Dublin or Belfast. Uh, it's really important that we keep the spirit and the legacy of the work that Donald did. Uh, and I know uh, that's something that's uh, close to the heart of, of Anne and Maura. Finally, on behalf of Patricia, who had to leave, who's the chair of Nevin, I do want to acknowledge uh, the work and the contribution of the Nevin staff, a very small team of, of people who uh, create a major impact 
uh, to Kieran, to Lisa, Paul, uh, Louisa, under the new leadership of the two acting co-directors, Paul McFlynn and Tom McDonald. A big thank you to all the work that you do do because uh, the, I the ICTU took a decision, the executive, some years ago that it was very important that we had a progressive centre-left economic think tank island-wide, because we're an all-island body too, north-south, um, to, I suppose, change the narrative and tr try and influence the debate uh, on the economy and the future of the economy and society on this island. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that the Nevin Institute and the staff that are in it under the current leadership certainly punch well above their weight. So well done to each and every one of you in the work that you do. So finally, thanks very much for all your attendance, uh, and uh, I believe lunch will be in the members' room, and the Nevin staff will show you where that is. Thanks very much. Thank you.